Yes, it is going to be amazing. You're right, chat room. Welcome to the Bitcoin Show. I'm Bruce Wagner, as I'm sure you know. Um, today, it's you and me. We're going to talk. I'm going to talk to you, the Bitcoin community, about what's going on. And I'm so happy that you've joined us. Today's episode is brought to you, by the way. We have to thank our sponsors because I wouldn't be here to talk with you if it weren't for them, their generous uh, sponsorship of our show. First, Carpe VM. Carpe VM is C-A-R-P-E. VM.com. Check them out. The video marketing. Seize your market. Say it with video. They'll help you make a professional video for your website to market whatever it is that you're selling. And Mezzi Grill. Of course, authentic Mediterranean food meets modern flavor. Our favorite place. We eat there at least once a week. Mezzi Grill. M-E-Z-E Grill.com. And TradeHill.com. TradeHill is the, the new online exchange that you can trade any currency, almost any currency in the world for Bitcoin and vice versa. You can buy Bitcoin, sell Bitcoin online with ease without leaving your easy chair. And if you use the referral code for the Bitcoin show, you'll get 10% off all your trades for life. They're a uh, wonderful sponsor. The code is TH-R141. That stands for Trade Hill dash referral code 141. That's TH-R141. You get 10% off for life. We're so grateful for our sponsors for allowing us to be here today. Today what I want to talk with you about is the recent media coverage that Bitcoin has been receiving. Uh, at first there wasn't any media coverage for the longest time and in fact Wikipedia uh, took the Bitcoin page down. As you may remember if you've been in it for a while, Wikipedia said no there wasn't enough mainstream media coverage to verify that Bitcoin actually existed. Remember that? Well now there's plenty of media coverage. The initial media coverage was very good, very interesting. Uh, everybody was fascinated with this new technology. Now things are changing because, uh, well, you can make your own theories as to why, but we can only guess. But uh, you know, the one of the first ones that really hit mainstream, as you may recall, is the uh, Forbes article, May 9th edition, and uh, that's Andy Greenberg. He did a great article. He he interviewed myself and uh, Gavin Andres, and, and he really did his homework, and he really did a good job. That was Forbes then. Now, uh, if you take a look online at Forbes, you'll see uh, an article today, I guess. Um, it's, called, it's by Tim Worstall. It's called, So That's the End of Bitcoin Then. All right. So what I want to do is I'm going to just go through these articles in hopes of um, educating not only the public, but journalists, journalists who are reporting about Bitcoin, because I, I mean, maybe I'm a little bit hard on them, but I call it lazy journalism. If you're going to write an article about toaster ovens, you really might want to Google it, you know, read a little bit, learn about what it is, because there's so many things that are just so off the mark, absolutely inaccurate. So um, let's look at this article. He says, um, so that's the end of Bitcoin then, all right? Or at least it looks like the end of Bitcoin. I'm just, I'm just going to paraphrase, I mean not paraphrase, but I'm going to quote just a certain sections that I want to emphasize. He says, the initial problem leading to the price collapse was one that, uh, was that one user tried to sell more than the market could absorb. <clears throat> for of course the value of anything is determined by the balance of supply and demand for it, thus the price crashed, and you can see a chart of how quickly it did here. What he's talking about is the Mt. Gox uh, exchange and how the flash crash is what he's describing. The problem with it, I mean, it is technically accurate, the price did plummet, okay, because one person tried to sell more than the market could absor absorb, as he's saying. But that's not the whole story. It's very misleading. <laughs> My famous quote, it's not a lie, it's true, but it's very, very misleading, okay, because that's not how it happened, really. Somebody didn't just decide to sell a lot of Bitcoins. What happened is one account was brute force attacked. That means they used a computer to guess your password because somebody put in, you know, Apple Banana as their password and they had, you know, eight or ten million dollars in that account. They attacked the account, they got into the account and they decided they wanted to withdraw the money. And the only way they could get out that much money, because there's a thousand dollar a day limit on Mt. Gox, as you may know, or a thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin. So the only way they could get out the maximum number of Bitcoin for this thief was to devalue the currency. The only way they could do that was to sell all eight or ten million dollars worth of Bitcoin and at that po point in time it was seventeen dollars and fifty cents. They sold all of it for a penny. Of course they wiped out the whole order book, everybody got <laughs> the Bitcoins they wanted and they dropped the, the, it was a flash crash, it went right down 
to one cent. Of course, that's not the real market value of a Bitcoin. The real value of a Bitcoin did not change because this guy did this. He's just a thief, okay? So if you, if you steal somebody's jewels and you sell them for a dollar a piece, it doesn't mean jewelry is now worth a dollar a piece. Very, very misleading. That's not what happened. The other exchange sites were hardly affected at all. In fact, I just checked um, and, uh, before the show and Bitcoin on, on, uh, Mount, on uh, Trade Hill is like $16.50. So in spite of all this negative press, and these really, really misleading articles saying that Bitcoin dropped. This is a devastating thing that Mt. Gox got hacked. Don't get me wrong, this is really devastating. They had something like 90% market share of the online purchases and sales. However, it, the value of a Bitcoin has gone down from then to now by $1. From 1750 to 1650 approximately. You can go to tradehill.com and click on market data and you'll see the value. Everybody is looking at tradehill.com right now for market data of the real value of a Bitcoin because Mt. Gox is down at the moment. It's, by the way, their opening up um, has been delayed. It was supposed to happen at, I think, 11 p.m. Eastern time last night, but they're not getting the accounts verified quickly enough. They're understaffed, so they've pushed it back for uh, 24 hours. So the last I read, it would be 11 p.m. Eastern time tonight. Mt. Gox will be back up. All right, so again, very misleading that that somebody decided to sell and the market value went down. That's not the real market value. That's just theft. All right. Then he goes on. Um, this is a he heading section. Bitcoins aren't secure. Okay. And again, I'm going to say that you need to be rem reminded that Bitcoin itself has always been secure. It's completely secure. It's unhackable with today's technology as far as anyone knows. Nobody has ever been able to hack it. Nobody knows how it could be hacked with today's technology. Um, the Bitcoin network was absolutely unaffected. The value of Bitcoin was almost unaffected. Um, it was just one exchange site, happened to be a big one, and really, really disastrous. It would be like MasterCard Visa going down. What would that do to credit card processing, right? It was, ma it was major, major disaster for the Bitcoin world, yet the price was hardly affected. If you look at Trade Hill, the price is almost the same. Okay, so Bitcoins aren't secure, he concludes as both the recent theft of his, this password problem shows, you know, passwords are not secure if you use obvious passwords. I lectured you guys the other day about this. You have to use long passwords, okay? It's not convenient and you won't be able to remember it, but I want your password to look like your Bitcoin address. It's gotta be random letters and numbers and throw a symbol in there, but it, and it has to be unique. It has to be something you don't use on any other site. Because this is a, another disaster that's happened is mybitcoin.com, which is a, a Bitcoin only, Basically, it's a web-based Bitcoin service, like Gmail is to email, my Bitcoin is to Bitcoin, okay? So it's a real, real easy to use Bitcoin, online Bitcoin application, and, and we recommend it for anybody who's not technical. However, you gotta make sure you don't have a virus, because a keyboard capture virus will capture your login ID and password no matter where you bank, you know, even if it's Citibank, okay? So you have to secure your password, you have to use a computer that doesn't have a virus. I recommend you use Ubuntu Linux, or Mac as a second choice, definitely not Windows. You know, but do what you can to make sure you're using a clean computer when you're, when you're accessing online banking. All right, so passwords is an issue. Don't use the same password. About 1% of uh, my Bitcoin customers have lost their Bitcoin because they use the same login ID and the same password for both, okay? So he goes on, uh, Bitcoins aren't secure. Then he says, Bitcoins are not liquid, nor a store of value as the price collapse shows. And then none of those things, uh, and if they're none of those things, they're not going to be a great medium of exchange, either as who would accept them. Okay, so obviously this is absolutely false. They are an excellent store of value. The, the, the price of a Bitcoin has hardly changed at all. They're completely secure. And more and more retailers are accepting them every single day. If you go to bitcoinme.com and click on the uh, shopping tab, you'll see a scrolling list of things from peanut butter to clothing to electronics to consumer goods, whatever it is you wanna buy, all these things will scroll by, amazing assortment. You, you, it looks like you're looking at Amazon or eBay, all the things that you can buy with Bitcoin. More and more retailers every single day, and uh, including, in fact, Amazon. You can go to tradehill.com and you can actually find an item on Amazon that you like, take the URL, paste it into Tradehill, and you can actually buy anything on Amazon with Bitcoin right now. So <clears throat> it's, it's absolutely false that uh, no one will accept them. It's absolutely false that they're not secure. 
and it's absolutely false that uh, they're not liquid. You can sell Bitcoins instantly on Trade Hill and withdraw it with a direct bank deposit, ACH direct deposit into your US bank account in dollars or into your European bank account in euros right now on the spot within moments. So it, it's just nonsense. His conclusion, it's difficult to see what the currency has going for it. Okay, that's lazy journal journalism, I'm sorry. I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't even know what Bitcoin is. He doesn't understand it. Okay, the next one is, uh, it's called uh, Bitcoin Virtual Money Gets Hacked and Heisted, okay, by Helen A.S. Popkin. I actually, when I, as soon as I saw this, um, I tweeted Helen, and uh, I said, I'm not a fan of your article because uh, it's full of inaccuracies. And she, says, she replied and said, how many? But that's, that's all I heard from her. She says, um, okay, did you hear about the $500,000 heist of online currency this month? That's true. No, I mean, yeah, somebody stole it, you know. You have $500,000 worth of cash. It doesn't matter if it's green paper or electronic, you know, digits on a disk. It's $500,000 in cash. Of course someone's going to steal it if you don't secure it. It's your responsibility to secure your cash. Not only was the digital dough stolen, but the theft was followed by a major hack at an exchange website that led to precipitous drop in the currency's actual value. That is false. Absolutely false. Um, First of all, the, the theft had nothing to do with the, the crash, as I've already explained. They're completely separate incidents. Secondly, the crash, as I've already explained, had nothing to do with the actual value of Bitcoin. It had to do with someone stealing someone's account and selling all their Bitcoins for a penny. Did I explain why? Because the reason he had to get it down to a penny is that then he could withdraw $1,000 worth of Bitcoin if they're a penny apiece. He could get something like 100,000 Bitcoin. So that was his way of getting it out. Obviously, Mt. Gox and all the exchange sites have fixed this. So if there's a sudden change, first of all, the market will freeze. Secondly, all withdrawals will be frozen. So this is not going to happen again, I can, I'm sure, unless there's a new exchange site that is not careful. Um, but yeah, the, the, the um, a pre a precipitous drop in the currency's actual value is absolutely false, obviously. Uh, Bitcoin, the first decentralized digital currency, suffered a personal data breach. Not true. Bitcoin did not suffer a personal data breach. Mt. Gox did. Okay, um, Mt. Gox caused value to drop from $17 to a penny. Obviously, not really true. The Bitcoin didn't change its value, just uh, the flash crash did. And by the way, when Mt. Gox is coming up, they're reversing all the transactions back, which is a common thing in the stock market. Whenever there's a major, major error, a major flaw in the system, they will reverse all the transactions to what it was before. That's what they're about to do. Um, the actual value of a Bitcoin did not change. If Bitcoin is a virtual currency, how and why can it have value, let alone lose value, and be stolen? Okay, Helen, I'm sorry, you, you just haven't even Googled it. You don't know, I mean, w the US dollar is a virtual currency. I don't know if you know, but 99% of all US dollars are digits in a computer. What's the difference? It's a virtual currency. If you bank online, it's a virtual currency. If you use a Visa, MasterCard, debit card, PayPal, it's a virtual currency. So of course, of course it can be stolen. Of course it can have value. So, um, how can it be stolen? I mean, that's just crazy. That's, that seems like something a child would ask. I'm sorry. Bitcoin has, real currency, has real, Bitcoin has real currency value outside the virtual environment, and on occasion, the value has, at times, been higher than the US dollar. Yeah, that's interesting. Since February 9th, okay? October, we call it parity day, when Bitcoin reached a dollar value, a US dollar value. Um, what was it, around the end of October? Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, chat room, uh, the end of October, it was uh, about six cents, and now it's whatever, 1650. On February 9th, it was a dollar. That was the day it reached a dollar. It's been above a, do above a dollar ever since February 9th. Um, so, you know, it's just so misleading to say on occasion it's reached over a dollar. Okay, moving on down. What can I buy with bitcoins? She's got a whole section. What can I buy with bitcoins? Well, illegal drugs. That's her answer. That's what you can buy with Bitcoins. I, do you know how many people I know use Bitcoins every day? To tons and tons and tons of people are into Bitcoin. Nobody I know has ever bought illegal drugs with them. Nobody I know has ever gone to that one website that a couple kids started on a hidden secret network and bought illegal drugs with it, you know? Do you know how many people I know use US dollars and cash? Do you know how many people I know who have bought illegal drugs with US dollars and cash? It's absurd. Everybody has to see that it's absolute absurdity to blame the currency for something that one person bought. You know, 
I know it's not one person, but no one I know has admitted to me that they've ever bought any, anything Ill, at all illegal with it. So, you know, I think that if that's really the issue that anybody has with Bitcoin, they really need to start looking at banning U.S. cash. The U.S. dollar issued by the Federal Reserve, the green bills, they should look at banning that first since 99.99999% of crimes use, you transact in U.S. dollar cash. You know, it's ridiculous. It's like banning a telephone because it could be used as a crime, for a crime, or banning cars because they could use, be used as a getaway car. You know, it's, everybody has to see how ridiculous that is. It makes great headlines. It's like, ooh, that's the drug dealer's currency. No, it's not. Nobody I know uses it to buy or sell drugs, to my knowledge. Of course, they might not have told me, but I doubt it. Bitcoin is the people's money. It's the currency of the people. It's a global currency everyone can use. You can use it no matter whether you live in uh, Uzbekistan or Cairo or Sweden or Australia. It doesn't matter. It's all the same. It's global. It's like email. It's like the internet itself. It's really about freedom from the tyranny of the world banks who control everything. We all know that. All you have to do is go to Google Video and uh, you know, do a search for money as debt. And you understand that money is being used to, as debt and debt is being used as a modern form of slavery for individuals and for nations. And people are over it. People are fed up. And then the government bailing out these institutions? You know, no, I think that's over. She goes on and says, you can trade Bitcoin for real world money at Bitcoin exchanges, such as the hacked Mt. Gox. But as mentioned earlier, it's not worth much right now. Yeah, only 1648. It was 1750 right before Mt. Gox crashed, the flash crash. And now it's 1648. So yeah, not much right now. Remember, it was six cents in October, $16.48 now. Show me an investment that has doubled since October. Just asking, okay? Not worth much right now. How come everybody's trying to buy Bitcoin and nobody I know, almost nobody I know is trying to sell? The only people that I know that are trying to sell are people who are testing the system. I have a friend who bought $3,500 worth uh, one week later, uh, not from me, but from someone else, the, the local exchange things. You can actually, there's a thing called btcnearme.com and you can go there, type in your zip code and it'll give you a list of all the people that are um, in your area that are willing to buy and sell Bitcoin with you and you can actually meet them and do it you know, face to face. There's no trust involved because uh, they're giving you cash and you're giving them Bitcoin electronically through your phone or your laptop or vice versa. So you don't even have to know them from Adam. <clears throat> but um, anyway, he bought $3,500 worth of Bitcoin and then um, a week later he sold it for like $10,000 and he just got the envelope of cash. I saw him, I was there. He got the envelope full of cash from the uh, person. <laughs> he didn't even open it, didn't even count it. He just looked at both of us and he goes, okay, now if I give you this right back and buy more Bitcoin, can you buy it right away? That was his question. So he's done that like three or four times. And the only people that I know really in my circles, which is pretty big, I'm pretty, pretty connected to the Bitcoin community, I would say, right? Um, people email me and send me stories all the time constantly. They, uh, the only people that I know that are actually selling it are either one of two things. Either they're, they're really, really hard up for money and they need to pay their rent right now, or they're trying to, um, trying to test the system, get the cash back out, put the cash back in and see how well it works. All right. So her next section is how the heck do you steal virtual money? It just doesn't even, it doesn't even, you know, deserve a comment. How do you steal virtual money? How do you steal electronic money now? You know, it's absurd. It's absolutely absurd. So sorry, reporting fail. Okay. The next one is, um, this one really upset me because this uh, gentleman, um, actually, Daniel Roberts uh, reported this for uh, Fortune, not the actual print magazine, just, just the blog online, fortune.com. But he interviewed me, he called me up and he wanted to interview me one morning and uh, I gave him the interview. One of the things that I had said to him was, please do better than Business Week did. I mean, Business Week did okay, but they got a couple things not so okay. And I said, you know, do better, check your facts, have somebody read it before you publish it. You know, you don't have to give them any permission to change anything, but just at least have somebody read it and make sure it's accurate. He said, oh, no problem. We're not like Business Week. We check our facts. 
You know, we check our facts. We know what we're doing. We're professional and all that stuff. Some kind of a story like that. Well, <clears throat> all right. So I, I, I gave him quite a bit of time on the phone and uh, he came out with this article. He gave me the link later and oh my gosh, I was so upset. Oh, and by the way, before, before the interview, before the interview, he said, you know, when I was telling you, he, he says, we check our facts and we're, we're very accurate. He, um, he said that um, uh, people may not agree with our stance on it. People might not agree with our take, our spin on this story. But, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we're accurate with the facts. So that kind of, that's before the interview. So that kind of like laid a little hint that maybe he was assigned this project and said, I know you don't know what a Bitcoin is, but I want you to have a story ready by, you know, X, X PM tomorrow. And it's, the topic is Bitcoin and the stance is it's terrible, it's illegal, and no American should ever have the option to use it. I don't know. I mean, it seems a lot like these stories are assigned saying, do something about Bitcoin and make it negative. I don't know. That's just what it seems like. That was my feeling. When I read the article, you know, it was just full of inaccuracies. And I did email him and I told him about these. You know, if you, if you read the original article, he's changed a couple things, but not much. You know, first he talks about Mezzy Grill accepting Bitcoin. He never, apparently never even visited Mezzy Grill. I don't know. Apparently not. He says they sell burritos. They don't sell burritos. It's not Mexican. It's Mediterranean food. As you know, they're one of our sponsors. You've probably been there. Um, <clears throat> they don't sell burritos. Okay, but this is just starting off on the wrong foot, right? Um, he goes, uh, although so far not a single customer has paid this way, referring to Bitcoin. That's absolutely not true. I know dozens of people who have paid for, uh, for their dinner there with Bitcoin. In fact, you know, we had just like a couple nights before he actually interviewed me. It's absolutely not true. Next, I mean, and wherever he got his information, it's false. Okay, it's absolutely false. And you really should check your facts. Um, I was told by the owner of Mezzy Grill, he never even spoke to him. Never, not even once. Okay, um, number three, uh, quote, uh, dot, 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 and many of its uses have nothing to do with Silk Road. Talking about Bitcoin. And many of its uses have nothing to do with Silk Road. Wow, what a surprise. True. Many of its uses have, that's like saying many of its uses of US dollars, green back Federal Reserve, green paper bills, many of their uses have nothing to do with buying crack from a drug dealer. It's absurd. Why would you have to say that? Nobody I know has ever told me that they have bought drugs from anybody. A couple kids start a website and now it's the currency of choice. It's just ridiculous. Um, you know, the, uh, nobody, knows, nobody uses it for that that I know of. It's absolutely irresponsible reporting to say that. Blatantly misleading that anyone uses Bitcoin for such things. I mean, very, very few people per, as a percentage wise. And like I said, probably, uh, you know, like I said, 99.99999% of drug deals are done with US dollars paper currency. So, and then he goes on, let's see. He says, in simple terms, here has, here's how it works. He's, he's explaining how Bitcoin works. In simple terms, here's how it works. You download, uh, after downloading a desktop software client, the most popular one is Dwala. This is not even a complete sentence and it's full of untrue things. Um, there is no need to download a desktop client. Like I said, you can just go to mybitcoin.com and click sign up and now you have a Bitcoin account, a Bitcoin address. You don't need any desktop client installed. Secondly, Dwala has nothing to do with Bitcoin. That's like saying PayPal. You download a PayPal to buy Bitcoin. That's nonsense. It's absolutely nonsensical. Dwala is not even a desktop client. Dwala is not a desktop client. It's a website. And Dwala is similar to PayPal. And neither one has anything to do with Bitcoin whatsoever. Except that you could use that. That's like saying you download a MasterCard Visa and you buy Bitcoin with it. It's, it absolutely makes no sense. So anyway. Dwala doesn't have anything directly to do with Bitcoin at all, and it's not a desktop client, and you don't need a desktop client for Bitcoin. Then he goes on, each Bitcoin is associated with a URL where the users can see the entire history of the coin's use, including every user that bought or sold it. Okay, no. That's extremely, extremely misleading. It's just not accurate. There is a URL, uh, there's a website called Blockchain Explorer, where you can see sort of a scrambled serial number of a transaction, but you can't see any users, much less any users that bought it or sold it. First of all, it is not an it. Okay, the blockchain 
For those who want to know a little bit about how it works, it's a shared file among all the users. The blockchain is not like a string of dollar bills with serial numbers, all scotch tape going on and on and on. The blockchain is more like a series of checks, but the only thing they have is an account number from and an account number to and a dollar, like a Bitcoin dollar amount, right? And that's about it, okay? And the account, you can get a new account number, as many account numbers as you want. So that's why they call it pseudo-anonymous. Because if you get a brand new account number for every single transaction, you can make it pretty anonymous. Uh, about as anonymous as cash. But it, you certainly cannot see any list of users. You cannot see any record of a single Bitcoin. And, um, you know, it's just, it's just absurdly misleading. Uh, let's see, what else? He says, Bitcoins have volatile ups and downs, but never a full crash. Once again, you know, they don't really have, it has, I mean, I guess it's volatile to a certain extent, because like I say, Bitcoin value goes like this, you know, it goes up, it, hit, it reaches a high, and then it goes down like this. All you have to do is look at the charts. I'm not making this up. Just look at the charts. And don't quote me, but look at the chart of the history. The Bitcoin, it goes up, and then it goes back down. Then it goes about 60% back up, and then, it, and then it levels off. Then it goes up and then down and then up and down. So it goes up and down and up and down and up and down on its way up. And this is pretty much how it's been since October. Like I said, look at the chart yourself. That's where the data is. But you can see that even though it's sort of volatile, I call it vibration on the way up. Even if you, most of the time, it, it seems if you buy high and you end up later selling low, you still sold it for a lot more, twice as much as you, as you bought it for in many cases. So it's not really that volatile, and it's never had a crash. It's never had a complete crash, ever. Um, you know, just, a, just little dips. It's actually just little dips. You buy in the dips. When it goes down, you don't go, oh my God, oh my God, it's going down, oh my God, it's going down, let's sell. And then it, go, it goes up, and then they're like, oh my God, it's going up, oh my God, it's going up, oh my God, it's going up, oh my God, buy. You know, if you do that, you're not smart. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you don't buy when everybody else is buying and it's high, and sell when everybody's selling and it's going down. When it goes down in the dip, that's when you buy. I say Bitcoin's on sale. They're having a sale on Bitcoins today. You know, not today, it's 1650, you know. So it's sort of on sale because of the Mt. Gox thing. It probably is a good time, but whatever. I don't give financial advice, as you know. But uh, anyway, obviously, who doesn't know? Buy in the dips and don't sell. And if you're gonna sell, sell in the peaks, not in the dips. And don't wait until you're desperate for the money either. Hopefully, anyway. Um, what else? Now there are even other bit -like, Bitcoin-like currencies, such as name coins, which are bought uh, with Bitcoins, used to pay for domain hostings. Some, trader, uh, some traders believe the biggest potential in these is the limitless creation of these e-currencies. You know, <clears throat> that's the thing that... Um, name coins is a completely separate system that's, that is exactly that. It's designed for uh, domain name hosting because there's a problem with a centralized system of DNS, domain name hosting, and they want it to be absolutely distributed, and the problem is that you have to be able to buy registrations of domain names. To my knowledge, the, the latest information I have is that uh, Namecoin is, is being generated, but it's not really, it's not a currency, and the idea behind the system was to register domain names. So, you know, it's not ready. It's not ready for prime time. It's totally alpha as far as it's used for that. Um, yes, you can create an infinite number of currencies. If your name is uh, uh, Billy Bob, you can create Billy Bob coins if you want. It's open source software. Anybody can take it, modify it, change the name, and start your own blockchain. The question is, who's going to buy and sell using Billy Bob coins? I don't know. You know, there's, uh, there's, a, there's something to be said for being the first to market with any, any kind of a product or, or item. And so, you know, it's like a nightclub on Saturday night. Everybody goes to this club because everybody goes to this club. And everybody goes to this club because everybody goes to this club. Everybody's using Bitcoin because everybody uses Bitcoin. Everybody uses Bitcoin because everybody uses Bitcoin. If they start Billy Bob coin, then who's going to use it? I don't know. You know, it could happen. It could definitely happen. Then, it, you know, if you see that happening, it might be time to get into it. Who knows? Just keep your eye on what's going on. Read the news. Go to Google News and, and go to Google News Alerts. Google the word News Alerts and put in a, a, a search term for Bitcoin and you'll read everything that's happening in the Bitcoin world. Next he says, at the moment, Bitcoins can't really be used at any mainstream retailers. Obviously not true. Amazon.com, you can buy any product on Amazon.com. 
via Trade Hill, as I said, and you go to bitcoinme.com and click on the shopping tab and you'll see all the items that are scrolling by and the list is just getting longer and longer and longer. Those guys, we interviewed them a couple days ago on the show and um, it, he's, <laughs> he's having such a hard time keeping up with all the new sites that are springing up every single day that want to accept Bitcoin. Who doesn't want to accept Bitcoin? Because the value of the currency keeps going up over time. So wouldn't you rather, would you rather have a dollar bill, a US dollar that uh, has lost 96% of its value since 1913? Did you know that? In 1913, that's when they created the Federal Reserve, by the, by the way, the private corporation bank that's not part of the US government. And uh, if, you, if you doubt that, there was a, a big case where an employee of the Federal Reserve was in some sort of an accident and they had some sort of immunity for federal employees but it was proven in court that they were not a federal employee why because in court they proved that the federal reserve is not part of the federal government that's the big lie the big secret you know the, the Bernanke or whoever will be on TV on a Sunday morning show and they'll say uh, the federal reserve unlike other branches of the government what it's not a branch of the government. It's just blatant, blatant, if not lies, mistruths. You know, it's absolutely misleading. So to go on, um, uh, according to the wiki list of businesses that accept Bitcoin, you can currently buy real goods and services, but not exactly talking about Amazon. Well, yes, we are talking about Amazon. I just got done saying you can use them on, through Trade Hill. Um, Trade Hill is not just converting Bitcoin to Amazon money. On Trade Hill, you can completely make the purchase using only Bitcoins, basically with one click. You just go to Amazon, find the item you want, take the URL, paste it into Trade Hill, and you can buy it with your Bitcoins. Because one click, it takes your Bitcoins, sells them for the exact number of US dollars, buys the uh, you know, prepaid card behind the scenes, and makes the purchase all with one click. Effectively, for the customer, it's the same thing as cl clicking buy this Amazon.com item with Bitcoins. Okay, then he mentions burritos at Mezzi Grill again, which they don't sell. Uh, then he says, um, if they really wanted to ensure that they aren't losing money from sales paid with Bitcoins, they'd have to watch the exchange rate closely and adjust their price every single day. Well, this problem is being solved right now with a whole bunch of uh, new startups who are doing exchange, uh, services for merchants. They're doing hand-holding from beginning to end for a merchant. So if you're a store, I mean, right now, it's super easy to accept Bitcoin. If you go to bitcoinme.com and click on accept, there's a real simple little kit you can download that you can put the emblem in your window and um, it shows you how to create a QR code for your Bitcoin address and accept it to the cash register right now today. Okay, super, super easy. But for merchants that have like a high volume and they expect a lot of Bitcoin coming in, there are new startups that are going to be... Uh, uh, doing hand holding for the merchant from beginning to end and they'll, they're gonna offer things like this if you're a merchant that needs cash flow you need US dollar cash flow to, to reorder your products every week they will uh, you'll click if I want I want to buy lunch for you know $15 I, I click it'll take the exact number of Bitcoin that it needs for $15 out of my account as a, as a customer and then it will instantly sell those on the market into US dollars guaranteeing the merchant that number of US dollars and then automatically, nightly, deposit those US dollars into the merchant's bank account. Basically, it works just like MasterCard or Visa. And by doing this sale at the same moment as the receipt of the Bitcoin, they're guaranteeing the uh, actual US dollar amount. And that's important. Um, you know, I mean, but if, you're, if your cash flow is really tight, that's important. If cash flow is not tight and you want to go ahead and use that money to invest in Bitcoin, just leave it in Bitcoin. Who knows? It could be worth twice as much next week. That's not going to happen with the, um, the US dollar, as we know. It's never been a week that the US dollar, you re receive 100 US dollars, and by next week, it's now worth 200. Not that I know of. That's ever, never, ever happened. Um, let's see here. Okay, he says here, if the USA wants to shut it down, referring to Bitcoin, he's quoting me. Wagner reasons, the internet has a way of detecting censorship and rallying around it. Okay, he's, he's quoting me. The inter, quote, the internet has a way of detecting censorship and rallying around it. They could block Bitcoin transactions, but it would be censorship. Unquote. Okay, not true. I did not say that. Okay, I said to, to him in this email, I said, these were two completely separate, unrelated statements. 
you know, I, I think what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to insist that interviews are recorded and that we have a legal contract saying that I have, uh, you know, final cut because this is nonsense. I didn't say that. Um, they, he took two completely unrelated statements and combined them into one. The first one, what I said, uh, if I remember, was if censorship happens on the internet, the internet by its nature sees that as an error and routes around it. And I, that's not even a quote from me. I was like paraphrasing from somewhere, someone else that I read somewhere. But he tied that into a completely separate statement that happened several minutes later where I said something like, most likely, no, the U.S. government could not completely stop the Bitcoin network if you research this, you'll know this. To my understanding, the only way bit the Bitcoin network can be stopped is to completely stop the internet. And the only way to completely stop the internet is to make it illegal and confiscate 100% of the computers and smartphones. Even then, as long as two computers exist in any other country on earth, the internet will still exist and thus, so will Bitcoin. If the USA decides to vote for internet censorship, I also said this, if the, USA, if the USA decides to vote for internet censorship, like they have in China, although they didn't get to vote, like they have implemented in China to a certain extent, it will not slow down Bitcoin at all. You know, file sharing of copyrighted material is legal. It's explicitly legal in many countries. Um, in the US, it's not legal. But either way, you know, it hasn't slowed it down. I'm just, it's just a fact. It's just absolutely a fact. Um, but that's what I actually said. He quote, I'm quoting him again in another section, but in fact, because users all have identifying web IDs, the government could rather easily identify users today, make it illegal to operate a Bitcoin node and drive users away with the same scare tactics that content industry uses on illegal downloaders. And censorship protests or not, there isn't much American traders could do. O-M-G. That's a thousand percent inaccurate, okay? Bitcoin users do not have identifying web IDs involved in, in Bitcoin, okay? Not at all. Um, first of all, you don't even have to download any software or be connected to any nodes. You don't have to run a node to use Bitcoin. That's ridiculous. Only like 2% of the Bitcoin users I know actually download a node and, and run it. Um, secondly, um, let's see, what else? Even if it were made illegal in the U.S., it would most likely not even cause a blip in the Bitcoin network. It really wouldn't. You know, there, the, it's been a while since I checked, but on the Bitcoin.org site, it was like 12% of Bitcoin users were in the United States. I mean, it's, it's just, you know, it's not going to even cause a blip in the Bitcoin network, actually. Um, if the United States decided to ban the Internet, seize and confiscate all computers and, and smartphones, and absolutely, like, outlaw electricity... It wouldn't cause a blip in the Bitcoin network. It really wouldn't. The reality is, I'm quoting him again, the reality is that a currency that has no regulator, trades on an open exchange, and can be easily stolen is one that won't sit well with lawmakers. Okay, since when do we care what sits well with lawmakers? Aren't lawmakers working for us? Aren't the people in charge of this country? Last time I checked, this was a free country. And we were able to vote, you know, and the lawmakers actually were supposed to represent us. No, what, what am I missing here? Who cares what sits well with lawmakers? What sits well with the American people and the people of the planet Earth is what matters. So the lawmakers better take heed and listen to what the people want. How about that for an idea? Um, so whether Bitcoins are a risky investment or not, expect Uncle Sam to keep the average American consumer from ever getting to make that choice. Really? Okay. He must have some inside information coming from on high that we, none of us are privy to. So I say, this conclusion really sounds like, I, I told him, I said, this conclusion really sounds like you were told what to write in this article and you were told what conclusions to make. The word misleading seems to be a real key concept to this article. And I, again, that's uh, the clock is ticking on Bitcoin by Daniel Roberts. That's very disappointing, very disappointing. And they call it Forbes. You know, it's just like, I can't believe that's associated with the same company. So let me take a quick moment to uh, thank our sponsors once again. Um, I realize that this is a total monologue today and we don't normally do that. We have fantastic guests. We have a lot of fantastic guests coming up this week too, like really, really major announcements. But these, this media attention is so important. I want journalists to pay attention. Use Google, ask an expert. 
you know, sometimes the experts are too geeky, they're too technical, and you don't understand what they're talking about. Well, talk to me, talk to somebody, talk to Gavin, talk to somebody who understands what Bitcoin is, but so before you just go off and, and have a two-hour deadline and write a story that doesn't, doesn't make any sense, it really doesn't make you look good as a, as a reporter. It really makes you look bad, okay? Uh, so I, I got to call, call some of these people out. So anyway, I want to take a, a moment really quick to thank our sponsors. I wouldn't be here with you right now if it weren't for them. So uh, thank you, Carpe Viem. CarpeVM.com is C-A-R-P-E-V-M. Stands for video marketing. Comp Carpe video marketing. CarpeVM.com. Seize the moment. Capture it in video. Uh, you, they will help you as professionals write and produce your, the video that you need for all of your marketing, whatever product or service it is that you're trying to sell. And everybody has something to promote. Otherwise, there wouldn't be billions of people on Twitter, right? <laughs> they will help you create a very professional video and you will look like a star and actually get sales out of it. So carpevm.com, we thank them for sponsoring uh, the Bitcoin show. When you talk to them, thank them specifically for Only One TV and the Bitcoin show. And Meze Grill, of course, the world's first restaurant, to my knowledge, correct me if I'm wrong, the world's first brick and mortar restaurant that also happens to have fantastic food. We love Marwan. Ask for Marwan when you go in. They're serving breakfast now too, not just lunch and dinner. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. He never stops working. <laughs> Mezzy Grill, M-E-Z-E-G-R-I-L-L.com, mezzygrill.com. They're right here in Midtown Manhattan. You know, we were wondering when they became a sponsor, how's this gonna work? Because they're a local New York establishment. You know, I mean, our audience is, you know, in Bangkok, our audience is everywhere on the planet. But as it turns out, uh, they're getting lots and lots and lots of um, attention and everybody either lives in New York. Every, I always say everybody who's anybody either lives in New York or they come to visit New York. They pass through New York. And when you're here, find Columbus Circle. It's the mo one of the most famous scenes in, in New York. You'll see the entrance, the famous entrance to uh, Central Park and all that. We'll go three blocks or not three, but whatever, a few blocks south to Mezzy Grill. And you got to stop in there for lunch or dinner. Authentic Mediterranean food meets modern flavor. Okay, then Trade Hill, obviously our buddies at Trade Hill, we talk to them all the time, they're on top of this. They're true professionals who have started an exchange site competing with Mt. Gox, but friendly and loving to the whole entire Bitcoin community. They're extremely supportive of Mt. Gox and all of the Bitcoin community during this crisis that's happening. Um, Tradehill.com, it's the easiest way right now to buy and sell Bitcoin online, in, and it's a cinch. You'll get 10% off of all trades if you, and you'll also support Only One TV. Support the Bitcoin show, and the Spanish language El Show de Bitcoin on Wednesday, 4 p.m. every Wednesday, um, by using the referral code TH-R141. It's on your screen now. 10% off all trades for life, TH-R141. Thank TradeHill.com for supporting us when you talk to them. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is uh, one that I just received this morning, and this comes from Australia. It's a tiny little article um, from, it's called the Courier Mail in Australia, but it's just an example. It doesn't matter how big time or small time you are. If you're, if you're calling yourself a journalist, um, I want you to act like a journalist, you know? I'm sorry, I gotta, gotta, gotta call you out on this stuff. It's just, some of the stuff that you guys are writing is absolute nonsense. Now, I mean, there are some fantastic articles. Don't, let, don't get me wrong. The, um, the best one I've seen from an accuracy point of view is The Economist. There's, there's a blog article in The Economist. Tell me, chat room, what's it called? Um, what the blog is in The Economist. They did a great, great article about Bitcoin. And they explained the technology behind it in really simple terms. Um, and uh, they just did a fantastic job. So anyway, check out The Economist and, and do a search for, just do a search on Google for Economist Bitcoin and you'll find it. But they did a great, great uh, job on that. And then um, the other one is uh, The New York Observer actually did a really, really nice article. And I think they're doing another one um, today or whatever. They, they said they've, they've received massive response from it. So, you know, Bitcoin is, is the hot topic, obviously, in the news. But please do your homework. Don't be sloppy. So here we have, you know, I, I just had to call people out on this. I'm sorry. You know, I, I don't like to be negative, but come on, come on. All right. 
this again, the Courier Mail in Australia, okay? And this guy's talking about the ABC is investigating, I don't know if they mean ABC, that must be um, a company there. I don't know if it's associated with our ABC, but it says the ABC is investigating whether staff used computers at the public broadcaster to run a virtual money marking market money making racket. Okay, so apparently ABC is the public broadcaster in Australia, not not American Broadcasting Corporation. All right. Australian Broadcasting Corporation probably. Okay, it's probably like our PBS in the US. Anyway, uh, they're saying that uh, the, this, this public broadcasting agency is investigating whether staff used computers at the public broadcaster to run a virtual money-making racket. They call it a virtual money-making racket. Um, Australian website Cricky on Wednesday published an article on ABC Insider that alleged that an IT worker at the ABC was using the network servers to mine the virtual currency known as bitcoins. The ABC said there are serious misconduct investigations underway in, in relation to this matter. Bitcoins are a new peer-to-peer -peer virtual currency said to be hacker-proof, untraceable, uh, not connected to any central bank. At its peak, the currency has been bought and sold for as much as $30 US. But its value crashed this month after a cyber attack on the Bitcoin exchange. Not true. Not true. It crashed for a moment, which was a false crash. It didn't really crash. The real value, still on Trade Hill and the other exchanges, went from 1750 to, well, what it is today, 1650 okay? Um, critics say that the untraceable nature of Bitcoins allows criminals to buy drugs and launder money online. See? Why do they have to say that? Why don't they why don't you say, critics say the U.S. dollar by its nature, allows criminals to buy, and drug, buy drugs and launder money online. The US dollar, PayPal, Visa, MasterCard. I mean, it's ridiculous. Money can be used for these things. It doesn't mean that, you know, that that's any connection to Bitcoin. Why do they have to throw this mud on something so wonderful, right? Bitcoin is the people's money, and they've they got to throw criminal things on it and throw drugs on it. Nobody I know has told me that they bought drugs with it. Um, and the, he goes on and on. Um, the, his, his final concluding line is, the racket was reportedly run from the ABC Innovation Division, which deploys and manages abc.net.au. So it's a money-making money racket. <laughs> okay. It's just, they, they have to use words like that. Racket, criminal, drugs, laundering. They, they have to do that, you know, because heaven forbid, you know, cash could be used that way. So, um, you know, I'm probably going to hear from a lot of people who buy drugs with it or something, but uh, nobody that I know has said that they have. Um, so, anyway, what do you guys in the, cash, in the, in the uh, chat room think? That, uh, is this reporting, like, completely irresponsible? Do you believe these journalists? Are they just being lazy, or do you think that they're being intentional about their uh, misrepresentation of Bitcoin? Either way. Is for you to decide. But um, I think that's a wrap. Thank you guys for joining us today. And we're going to be back with another fantastic show tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, every weekday, Monday through Friday, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern, The Bitcoin Show. And weekly, Wednesdays at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, El Show de Bitcoin in Espanol. And by the way, before we go, I want to tell you that uh, thanks, guys, <laughs> for that, uh, saying we did a great job. Thank you so much. Um, I want to tell you, by the way, the only one TV network is onlyonetv.com is not just a Bitcoin network. A lot of people are saying, is this all Bitcoin all the time? But no, it's not. We're in a rolling launch phase right now. So I'm saying the official launch date is uh, July 14th, which I kind of like pulled out of thin air. But the reason is because we're, gonna, we're launching with 29 shows initially. All right. So out of these 29 shows, about two thirds of them are English language. About a third of them are Spanish language, and one of them is actually Chinese, Mandarin Chinese. So that's the plan. We're rolling out 29 shows, uh, a wide variety of topics. Many of them are technology uh, related. Some are like very, very mainstream, kind of like an Oprah, you know, super mainstream. Um, some of them are sort of boutique technology things like Ubuntu, the Ubuntu show, which is about Ubuntu Linux on the desktop the free culture show, which is all about free open source software and free open source everything. All, everything's becoming free open source now. Architecture, uh, education, on and on and on. The free culture movement is about like Creative Commons license share alike things. And um, 
What else? The Android Invasion, of course, is about the Android operating system. We have WebVid Pro Show. The WebVid Pro Show is for web video. It's by, for, and about web video professionals. And that's actually going to be about what we do. We're going to show you behind the scenes what equipment we use, what cameras, what hardware, what software, um, how we do things. And uh, no, it's not perfect. It's, it's definitely a moving, moving target, but we're, we're getting better all the time. I hope the audio is better today. And um, we're going to teach you how to do what we do. Because uh, we're not all about like mine, 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 hoarding information. We're all about sharing. Uh, our mission statement at Only One TV, by the way, is to help as many people as possible, and that means masses of people in the most profound ways possible. And we do that by sharing information and knowledge, giving and receiving, and this is a community, and building community. And uh, this is new media. This is not old media, all right? So you get a say, and you get, you get to participate in the community. We have the chat room always. Uh, we're, we will always have a live chat room, um, and that's how you can communicate by Twitter, email, chat room. We're very, very accessible. Uh, you'll notice that you can call my phone and it was ringing the other day. You know, I turn, I, now, now I learned to turn it off. But uh, uh, we are accessible. If you call, I'll answer. All right? We're, we're about community. Um, other shows, uh, about two-thirds of the shows are what we call live to tape, which is what we're doing right now. This is live. It's broadcast, streaming live on the web, and it's also recorded at the same time, so you can watch it anytime you want to. So um, the reason we do it live, even though probably only less than 1% of the viewers will actually watch it live, um, maybe even less than that as a percentage, the reason we do it live is so that we can get your feedback immediately. We can read what you're saying in the chat. We can, we can uh, respond to emails and Twitter and so on. We're going to get more and more producers in here and it's going to get more and more professional. Don't worry. It's going to get better. It, every, as you can see, if you go back to the initial episodes, you'll see that it's getting better and better every time. That's my, my goal. My goal is not perfection. My goal is that today's episode is a little bit better than yesterday's episode. As long as we have continuous improvement, we know we're on the right track. I mean, isn't that everybody's goal in everything that you do? Okay, so back to this. So about two-thirds of the shows are what we call live-to-tape talk shows like this. Basically, it's a talk show. It's a different show, a different host, different topic, different theme music, and it's a different show. About a third of the shows are what I call FES, fully edited shows, the complete production shows. And those are on topics, um, all different types of things. We, have, we even have a sketch comedy show, which is going to be hysterical. We were recruiting some of the funniest comedians uh, from YouTube and from elsewhere, uh, comedy clubs and all sorts of venues all over the world, really, um, that are coming in to work on this amazing sketch comedy show. It's kind of like Saturday Night Live meets Little Britain, except it's not on Saturday nights, it's not live, and it is funny. So anyway, it's really, really cool. Um, a lot of amazing, amazing talent out there in the world, on YouTube, and in New York. We're right here in the hotbed of talent. So um, amazing technology shows and comedy shows and women's issues. There's one uh, about women's issues that uh, women should be talking about but aren't taboo topics. Uh, what else am I forgetting? There's so many. Um, Dr. Frugal has the Frugal Show about bargain shopping, how to, how to get insane bargains. I mean, he, he's gotten us cruise tickets on major cruise lines for, came out to like $35 a day one time. I mean, yeah, $35 a day on one of the trips we went on. Um, let's see, what else? Got, he got his American Airlines tickets to Spain for $130 each way. It was like $260 round trip, including taxes. I mean, he's a miracle worker when it comes to saving money. So you'll see Dr. Frugal on uh, the Frugal Show. I'm sure I'm forgetting a lot, but very soon, in the next day or so, we're going to have a list of all the shows. It'll be right there on the website. So stay tuned, and uh, thanks for joining us. We love you, and we'll see you tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern. Take care. Bye, guys. Yes, we do love you. <laughs> love you back.